Thank you. My name is Ian Kerr. I'm the CEO of Ocean Alliance, a group founded about uh, 43 years ago by Dr. Roger Payne. So we're based in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and I'm going to step back a little bit, if you don't mind. Clearly, we all understand that the planet is covered some 71% by water. That means whoever called it planet Earth should be fired. It's not planet Earth, it's planet ocean. But one thing a lot of people don't realize is 64% of the 71% of ocean are actually high seas or international waters. That basically means they belong to nobody. So if you take another step at that, it means technically 45%, almost half of the whole planet, belongs to nobody. And in England, and I, I, maybe you can tell from the accent, but in England, there's a guy called Garrett Hardin that did a study on what, what he called the commons. And the commons were the land that anybody could take their sheep or their animals and they could graze off the common lands. And what was interesting, he found that not only were the common lands being destroyed, but also the animals that were feeding on the com common lands were not as robust as the, as the animals feeding on private lands. And this was known as the tragedy of the commons. And right now, I think we're dealing with clearly what is a, a 21st century tragedy of the commons. Ocean Alliance is a group that works primarily with whales. And um, it's, been, it's been an interesting journey with successes and failures, etc. Believe it or not, actually, whales now probably face more threats than ever before. And as with many species now, we're not really just looking at the whales. We're actually looking at the habitat. So the big problem, as we're talking about today, is, is and the, the issue that Ocean Alliance has really been engaged in for the last two decades, although Dr. Payne will tell you this, I think there's nothing we would rather do less than work on, on ocean pollution. But the reality is we think it's perhaps the biggest threat to whales and, and perhaps even to humanity. So the issue really is, is the oceans are downhill from everything. They were talking earlier about how does this stuff get in there. It really gets in there because of gravity. Gravity never sleeps, so everything's inexorably making its way down to the oceans, whether it be a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade. Ultimately, all of this stuff is washing down into our oceans. And I'm sorry, Chris, to bring up some more of those statistics, but they say something like 1.2 trillion gallons of untreated sewage and stormwater just washes into our oceans on an annual basis. And it's something like 14 billion pounds of garbage are intentionally dumped in our oceans on an annual basis as well. And a great percentage of that is plastic. And you know, you think, well, that's OK. That's in the middle of the, middle of the oceans. But roughly 46% of all of the lakes in America are too polluted for fishing, swimming, or even you know, eating the aquatic life. We think that pollution is actually a climate change's evil twin. There's an issue with mammals of what we call bioconcentration and bioamplification. There's a specificity related to mammals, because mammals have what they call the generation effect, where they can pass the legacy of each generation uh, to the next. And then going on to Chris's work, and I think this is so interesting, you know, we are a visual species. Uh, Dr. Payne is so well known for his discovery that humpback whales sing songs. Whales are acoustic species, and Dr. Clark will be talking about that later. But we're a visual species. If we see something, we respond to it. And the problem with ocean pollution is there is no smoking gun. And even America's first uh, environmentalist, Henry David Thoreau, said, we do not associate the idea of antiquity with the oceans as we do the land. So unfortunately, this pollution issue is largely being ignored by the scientific community and governments. We've been in the Gulf of Mexico the last five years. The, over $500 million worth of grants have gone out to the Gulf of Mexico sort of studies afterwards. Less than 25 million of that 500 million went to toxicology. I mean, it's all about toxicology, but we can't see it and the governments ignore it. And I'm sure you've all probably heard that this quote by um, T.S. Eliot, this is how the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. So Ocean Alliance for the last two decades have been sending our research vessel Odyssey here around the world, collecting baseline data on the distribution, concentrations, and effects of environmental toxicants. Here's our research vessel Odyssey. Just so you know, this is our whale boom with Dr. Roger Payne there leading the charge. Uh, we're starting to use drones to collect whale snot, but that's another story. 
related to stress. But anyway, so we spent the last couple of decades going around the world collecting baseline data on what's out there and trying to understand what it means to the animals. So quickly, here's the Odyssey's route. We left from San Diego five and a half years later. We were back in Boston. We visited 11 eco-regions from Papua New Guinea to Kiribati to the Galapagos to Sri Lanka. So we really went all over the world. And we were looking at two major groups that, that you've heard a little bit about today, and you'll probably hear more. One are endocrine disrupting chemicals, and we've heard of those. They're also known as persistent organic pollutants. And we've got a whole list of them here, from pesticides to herbicides. Um, obviously, a big one nowadays are fire retardants. They're in everything. And what's interesting, when you look at um, um, uh, hexachlorobenzene, in this industrial fungicide, we were off Kiribati in the middle of nowhere, and we found high levels of hexachlorobenzene. I mean, clearly what this is demonstrating is, one, you know, the oceans are already polluted at an unacceptable level, but two, that ocean winds and ocean currents are carrying all this stuff around the planet. You can no longer really lifestyle yourself away from pollution. You know, you can't escape by living somewhere because the planet is basically doing what it's doing best. The oceans, if you like, are the blue blood of the planet, and that blue blood is pumping all this detritus around the planet. Um, the other group that we are looking at are metals. And of course, you know, metals are actually elements. They can't be destroyed nor, nor created. Um, they're difficult to dispose of when we extracted them. Some of them are essential. We need stuff like iron and zinc. Some like lead are only toxic. And as it says, uh, there's a broad spe spectrum of toxicity here. And what's interesting about metals, I mean, many of you probably heard about Aaron Brockovich. They were talking about chromium. But my wife, for a short while, worked in the cosmetic industry. And we were talking with that company. And they said, well, there's only a little bit of metal in, the, in, in these, in these uh, makeups. Yes, but it's a little bit of metal you're putting on your face and on your lips every day. And this is a huge concern for us and a huge concern for humanity is this sort of low-dose chronic exposure. So how do you measure low-dose chronic exposure? I'm not sure if many of you realize, but for a lot of um, wildlife, they do what they call LD50 testing. And they test a product on 20 bunny rabbits, and LD50 means 50% of the group has died, and they know, you know this is its toxicity. Well, you can't do that with an endangered species. So what we do is we collect a biopsy sample from a whale. And of course, you would say, well, how do you get a tissue sample from the whale? Well, forgive my British sense of humor, but I would say very carefully. Um, that's actually me sitting at the end of the boom. Maybe you can see here. I've got a little crossbow, and we have a biopsy dart, and we shoot this biopsy, and we get an, a razor-sized piece of um, blubber from the animal. It's about the size of a pencil eraser, and the top part is the skin, bottom is the blubber, and then we have this interface level, which is very important, which is the, um, it's the, gr the height of the highest growth, so we can grow cell lines or cell cultures that I'll talk about. But basically, you can see the, uh, the little biopsy tip here, and we get that, that sample, and we need to understand effects. So we built what was called a cell line laboratory on board our research vessel. We think it's the first ever cell line laboratory at sea. And then we started growing these cell line cultures. You see the first shot, here's the whale, here's the biopsy. They separate this little tissue piece out here. We put lots of little pieces of tissue in a warm broth with nutrient, and they grow out. And we get plates and plates and plates of living whale tissue, and we can do it with different organs. And then we expose these living cells to different concentrations of environmental toxicants, different combination of environmental toxicants over different time points. And then we can actually say, this is toxic to an animal or this is not, at a cellular level. So as I said earlier, though, we're most interested in genotoxicity. Genotoxicity is DNA damage. We also look at what they call uh, cytotoxicity, which is sort of cell death. Cell death would almost be you drink it, you fall over. You know, genotoxicity is this constant degrading of our lifestyles. And I think all of us, I think all of you must know somebody. You know, my own daughter is, um, um, has a problem with gluten, but we didn't have these intolerances, these early onset diabetes, all these, con all these things that our immune systems are being impaired. You're not actually sort of dying from the pollution, but you're dying from a, a, an effect or a compromise that's being put on your body due to these compounds. 
So just quickly then, I'm just showing you all the regions where we, where we sampled around the world. This is important because you need to understand with scientific data, you've got to be able to put it into context, okay? You can't just say, I found this. If there's no context, it doesn't mean anything. So luckily, having been all over the world, as Ocean Alliance does its toxicological studies, we can put stuff into context. So here we see briefly, just showing you, we were looking at chromium. Again, chromium was Aaron Brockovich and nickel levels in whales in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay? You can actually see the orange of the sperm whale global average, and then the yellow is um, um, the Gulf of Mexico and the green. And you can see that the, the amounts are quite, quite extraordinary, quite different. So the bad news quickly here is, yes, we've published a lot of papers. The first one saying chemical dispersants are cytotoxic and are genotoxic to sperm whales. We've actually said, yes, metal exposure to whales in the Gulf of Mexico is important. If you think about it, when the crude came up, it was bringing all those metals that typically get filtered out. We also did another paper with our partners at the WISE Laboratory of Environmental Toxicology, actually looking at the effects of the Exxon oil dispersants and the ones in the Gulf of Mexico. So the question is, how and why are we still using this stuff in our oceans? Again, I'm like everybody here. I'm not like one of these doom and gloom guys. I really believe we can change the world. And when we look at examples, I've just got a few in front of you. Individuals, look at the individuals here today. We can make a difference. I think Margaret Mead said a group of concerned individuals is the only thing that does make a difference. When you look at the corporate effect, well, again, look what G-Star are doing, look what Bionic Yarn are doing, but there's another corporation called, called um, Interface Carpets. They turned their company around. They made more money by going green. We've also got uh, Mexico City. It used to be one of the most polluted cities in the world, and now it's down to something like 59 on the list because they said, we're going to clean it up. And can we change the planet? Absolutely, we can change the planet. In 1985, you know, there's all this talk about the, uh, the expanding ozone layer, layer. And since that time, in 1989, we had the Montreal Protocol signed by all 197 UN members. And guess what? The ozone hole is getting smaller. At the end of the day, we just have to decide what value we put on the oceans. You know, let's just get personal here. And this is my quick hit list. I say, think blue planet ocean, not planet Earth. Think organic on the land, in our oceans, and in your body. Your body should be your temple. My wife's body is her temple. My body is my tent. But anyway, think recycle. Come on, cradle to cradle. I can't, somebody just brought out razor blades. You use them once and throw them away. What, what's going on here? And I can't remember the comedian's name, but uh, do we really need all of this stuff? that we use once and, and throw it away. And then action. You know, get involved. I mean, uh, there's a gentleman that said, Edmund Burke said, nobody did worse than he who did nothing for fear that he could only do a little. So think carbon footprint, live the change, flex your buying muscles, buy me a pair of G-Star jeans, and again, educate yourself and educate others. And uh, last but not least, I mean literally, what is the legacy that you want to leave? We have the opportunity to be the most celebrated generation in history because we knew this was happening and we did something about it, or the most vilified. So I say to you, what is your blue legacy? And I'm going to make another fascinating scientific announcement. This has never happened before, but since we're here, I wanted to do it at the G-Star event. Why do whales beach themselves? Rats. Another two feet and we'd have nailed those plastic discarding polluted two-legged freaks. Thank you.